Hi all, welcome to another episode of Technology Lowdown. My name is Nicholas and today we are looking at carrier grade NAT, sometimes referred to as large scale NAT. So we are going to look at some of the pros and cons of carrier grade NAT and why if you're one that requires remote access to your network, carrier grade NAT is something you should not ignore. So just some background on carrier grade NAT. Recently I was setting up one of these routers with a 4G USB dongle in here and I found that the IP address being assigned to this via the uh, cellular service that was connected to it was in fact an internal IP address which meant that when I went to setting up port forwarding nothing would work and this is because the provider which is Optus in Australia uh, has what's called uh, setting up a double NAT on your service so that you are unable to uh, uh, directly route traffic from the internet to your mobile device which is fair enough because mobile phones and other services don't generally need uh, to be accessible from the web uh, though if you do have a business service through a provider quite often they still do actually provide you with a public IP v4 address um, so the reason why we are seeing providers implement CG NAT or carrier grade NAT is it is a solution to the shortage of IPv4 addresses. Um, so this is something which is being implemented in the short term, I suppose, until IPv6 is fully and readily available. Now, although there are some providers which are implementing CG NAT and not actually looking down the pathway of IPv6, CG NAT um, is sometimes being implemented by providers as well as IPv6 and in Australia Aussie Broadband is an example of this so they set up CG NAT so you've got a uh, internal only IPv4 address but you are getting a publicly routable IPv6 address so that's okay so uh, just some background on what carrier grade NAT is. So if we jump on over to Wikipedia here, carrier grade NAT is an approach to IPv4 network design in which N sites in particular residential networks are configured with private network addresses that are translated to public IPv4 addresses. But where uh, CG NAT is different is it's going from your router to your ISP's internal network which is set up for their customers and then finally you're getting an a, uh, IPv4 address which is being shared with many others on your internet service providers network. So that's what CGNAT is about in a nutshell. One use of the uh, carrier grade NAT has been labeled as NAT444 uh, which basically sums it up as being a triple uh, NAT. So the triple NAT model, as we can see here, um, shows you've got your customer connection down here. This is your modem router. Your modem router is being assigned a shared IPv4 uh, before address range here from your internet service provider and picture many more of these being connected into this network uh, being assigned a 100.64.0. whatever uh, IP address there and then this router would then have access to an IPv6 address through most likely prefix delegation and you would also be able to access an IPv4 address but this IPv4 address is being shared with many other users uh, who are connecting to this ISP network. So that's basically how CG NAT is working. But the way that some ISPs are doing this is they're not actually having this uh, cloud here at all for IPv6. They're not using that and they're just giving you an IPv4 address. So it's uh, not really that useful in the end because you're still not publicly accessible from the internet um, through the use of an IPv6 address and of course they're not going to open up ports on this uh, IPv4 address at the ISP level to then direct it to your router. Um, 
So I suppose what works and doesn't work with CG Nat. So this diagram here I've come across from Chris uh, Grunderman and basically he's broken down quite well here what uh, services would and wouldn't work. So we can see that you know web browsing would work, email would work, you can download files with FTP, not large files because uh, quite often those large files I, I believe rely on passive FTP which uh, involves uh, uh, needing port availability um, and BitTorrent and LimeWare of course that would work and Skype, instant messaging so uh, Facebook, Twitter, you know lots of things would still work but the things which would be broken would be you know, downloads of large FTP files uh, online gaming and streaming or if you're hosting a uh, game server on your network for your friends to connect into that would not work um, video streaming would also experience issues depending upon what service you're using. You wouldn't be able to view things like your security cameras remotely, um, tunneling for uh, IPv6 to 4 or um, VPN encryptions. VoIP would also be uh, limited as well because that also relies on ports. So basically uh, as long as you're aware that uh, some of these services would not be working with uh, carrier grade NATs, well then I suppose I've done well in explaining this to you. In summary, what it boils down to is our ISPs need to start offering and supporting IPv6 addressing rather than just implementing more complicated measures that take away controls from the end user. Um, fair enough if the ISP is offering carrier grade NAT as well as IPv6 addresses which are publicly ra really routable, that is great. Um, but if they're just implementing carrier grade NAT because they don't own enough IPv4 addresses, then uh, I find that this isn't really providing a solution to the shortage of IPv4 addresses in the world and they would be better off actually going down the pathway of giving their customers IPv6 addresses and then providing a IPv6 to 4 uh, solution for their uh, backwards compatibility. Um, in Australia there are a handful of providers that are doing carrier grade NATs. Um, one that I can think of is Aussie Broadband. Um, uh, other services too, such as IINet, they um, don't provide a static IP, but I believe that they do actually now um, do carrier grade now. To, uh, you may have to correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, so when it comes time to subscribing to a new ISP, do your research and make sure you're not getting a service that is CG NAT, or else you may find that you're not li uh, that you're limited in the services you can run with your internet connection. I know that uh, if I hadn't done my research, I may have subscribed to a provider and then found that I wouldn't be able to access my security cameras remotely or uh, the files which I host on my NAS. So, uh, yeah, carrier grade NAT is something that you should definitely be considering if you are thinking about subscribing to a new internet service provider. If you have any questions, please comment and I will look to answer them. Um, I hope this video has been helpful to you. If it has been, please like it. If you would like to see more, please subscribe. And, yeah, I'll see you again soon. Bye.